Hi, Hi. I'm Mike I'm Holt, Holt with MikeHolt.com, Mike Holt Enterprises, and uh, we got a great little program tonight with a lot of questions that were submitted, and so let's get going. Today's Tuesday, April 14, 2020, and the best way to watch this program is going to MikeHolt.com slash live. If you're watching this videotape and it's not live, go to MikeHolt.com slash live, and there's a link to the previous videos that were made. First thing I'd like to do is just take a just moment take to thank, a thank God, God, giving me the opportunity, the opportunity to bless other bless people other with people the skills that he's given me, me. and I do appreciate that. appreciate that. All right, All right. first thing, first has, thing to has to do with, with I'm going to review a question that was reviewed, I think it was last week, and I want to kind of expand on it. People are giving me some feedback, and I think, let's kind of get on. It has to do with transformer wiring methods. First question is, Mike, Mike, I would like, I would you, to like you to review what is required, what is required by, the by the code and what is allowed by the code for the installation of transformers. transformers. Example, Example. Flex, flex is flexible, is flexible. Conduit, conduit required, required or allowed or, or not required. required. Bring, up Bring up points on the pros and cons of using conduit. conduit. Bonding, Bonding bushes may be required, but not always. So just a kind of general conversation about wiring methods, not the bonding and grounding of the transformer. First thing, let's go to a couple rules. If you go to 450.10a, now this video that we're covering is based on the 2020 National Electrical Code. If you're in a 2017 code, make sure you have your code book and uh, put it on pause, go back and read the code book. So there could be some slight changes in the text between your code book and what I'm covering. All right, first thing, 450.10a1 talks about that transformers a terminal bar for grounding and bonding connections must be installed and bonded to the inside of the transformer enclosure. Now, this is a code requirement that's relatively new. I, I, it probably came into the 17 code, maybe the 14, but I think it was the 17 code that it came in. That means there has to be an equipment grounding terminal bar with inside that transformer. Now, the transformers might be coming with that terminal bar as an accessory or might be installed uh, automatically they manufacture transformers. This is all relatively new as far as code is concerned. I'm not sure if all transformer manufacturers are requiring you to purchase as an accessory or whether it just automatically comes as part of the kit of a transformer. But assuming it doesn't, that means that you're going to have to install an equipment grounding terminal bar uh, inside that transformer enclosure and you're going to have to um, drill a hole, you're going to have to comply with 250, 12, which says like maybe um, uh, sand off some of the paint so they can make a good electrical connection. Uh, you're going to have to use a terminal equipment. You have to terminate it in accordance with 250.10, which talks about how you terminate equipment grounding terminal bars. And so it's going to have to be within a transformer. Um, anything else I want to say there? Um, no. I think that's all I want to say this graphic here. You'll see that apparently there was flex coming in on the primary side. So there's the equipment grounding conductor. Oh, there's an equipment grounding conductor on the secondary side, which means they, they would have ran flex on the secondary side. You notice there's no bonding bushings and bonding jumpers because it's not required by the National Code. Um, I know there are some parts of the country that they really believe it. As a matter of fact, I was in New York City last year, but maybe a year and a half ago, and I was at the, um, the IBEW Local 3 Training Center, and the practice in New York City is they always put bonding bushings and bonding jumpers on the raceways, both in the primary and the secondary, and I said, hey guys, you don't have to do that. And they're very strong about that. I look, you don't need to do that. And I really rather you not be showing guys how to do that because that gives the impression something is required that it's not. I heard, I don't believe it. Well, Mike, that's the New York City code. I'm sure that is not true. So just some experience that people are doing it and that is not part of the code. If anybody feels like a little offended, like what does he say, you know, well, then simply give me a code reference and show me where it is required. All right. Another rule that we should be aware of is two, I'm sorry, 450.9, which talks about ventilation. Transformer ventilation openings must be installed so that ventilating openings are not blocked by walls or other obstructions in accordance with the required clearances marked on the transformer. I've been, I looked, and maybe you guys can help me. I looked for a transformer so that I can get a picture of that where it says the required clearance. So if you're watching this and you happen to see a transformer, and if it comes with an equipment grounding terminal bar, take a picture of it, setting it on top there so I can see it. Make sure that you take the picture landscape, 
not portrait because I can't use portrait. And then if you can see something where it specifies about the clearance, please take a picture, send it to mike at michael.com, and then I can be able to use this possibly in the next presentation. So if there's any markings on that transformer about clearances, or if it's in the instruction saying, listen, you need to keep so much distance away from the sides, from the back, from the top, and, and, and sometimes you're gonna get that information. I did some research on that today, and there are apparently different types of transformers. There's a, a energy efficient transformer or something about well, the, a resin transformer and it was older transformer. So I can't give you a general statement, say, keep it six inches from the back or the side. So make sure you look at the transfer manufacturers. Taking a look at the text now, the graphic, I mean, of the, of the PowerPoint, it says, this is a new 2020 change. Transformer top surfaces that are horizontal, right? top of the transformer, it's flat and readily accessible, I'm not sure what that means. It means you can kind of get to it, which everything should be, get to it. Well, I guess, no, I guess if it was up on a, up in a ceiling somewhere, then it doesn't apply. It's only if it's gonna be readily accessible, Article 100, make sure you go back and read the definition, readily accessible, that you can walk over to it. You don't have to have a portable ladder. You don't have to stand on a, uh, on, on a five gallon bucket. You don't have to climb under something to get to it. You can just walk right up to it. If you got a transformer, there's a flat top there. Look what it says, must be marked to prohibit storage. So if anybody sees a transformer and on the top of that transformer, it's marked and it says something about prohibiting storage. Now, I'm not quite sure if that means you can't put your coffee cup there to keep it warm. You know what I mean? Because that's maybe that's, is that the purpose of the transformer? So if you can see a transformer where it has that information, um, and I'm not quite sure what it means by prohibiting storage, a lot of times when a code writes a language, they're doing the best they can to try to explain what it is. And we're all kind of trying to figure out what does it mean by storage? I believe, and uh, I don't have the information on this, but I believe transformers, when we talk about that clearance from, uh, for ventilation purposes, they, they're probably going to be some instructions that you cannot put a transformer on top of a transformer, or you have to have a clearance so many inches away from the top of the transformer, which has to do with heat. So, so just be real careful with transformers and make sure that it has the ability um, to have the ventilation to, to get rid of the heat as it was specifically designed. Uh, let's just take a look at this illustration, see what we have here. Okay, we have flexible metal conduit coming on the primary side, bigger wires. Oh, this is bigger wires on the primary, right? This isn't the primary? No, that's bigger wires on the primary than it's on the secondary. Black, red, blue. Huh, wonder why they did it that way. Okay, it looks like the primary is going to be lower voltage, and then it's going to be on the secondary. What do we have colors here? Oh, okay, brown, purple, uh, yellow. That Usually, it, brown, orange, yellow, but brown, purple, yellow is used in different parts of the country. Then There's no color code required. You don't have to use black, red, blue for 12208, and you don't have to use brown, orange, yellow for 277, 480. Let's take a look at the neutrals. The neutrals coming in are all white on the primary. Neutral conductors, by the way, are sized based upon the imbalance load. What the heck's going on here? Well, that's kind of crazy. Oh, you know what? What are these, H's or X's? What the heck is this? This is the secondary going out here. Because see the neutral conductors? You don't bring neutrals on the primary transformer. So, okay, so this is a, the I'm not used to seeing Primary coming in on the right. I'm used to seeing primary coming to the left. Maybe that's just all my graphics. So, all right. We had the primary brown, purple, yellow, smaller wires. And then it's black, red, blue. Oh, look at that black, red, blue. And that's going to be the secondary. And they're bringing neutral conductors within the raceway. And they're bringing equipment grounding conductors, which is, okay. There's your equipment grounding conductors for the, so this is, Three parallel sets, I don't know what size that is, 500 thousandths. And then on the, on the primary, they're bringing in, okay, there's flex, and they're bringing in the three phases. They don't bring a neutral. They bring the equipment grounding conductors, and there's that terminal bar that's required by 450.10A. And there's no bonding bushings and bonding jumpers either in a primary and secondary. Uh, that's correct. Let's see, where's the XO? Here's the XO. And the XO looks like it's actually they bond it right to the case. And somewhere in there is probably right here. 
This is probably the grounding electroconductor. And the grounding and bonding of a transformer is a little bit work, and that's in 250.30 rules, but we're not going to get into the bonding and grounding of transformers. This is not the scope of a one-hour program quickly running over code rules, but that helps us understand a little bit there. Okay, good there. Now, here's some information that I went online and I was checking about transformers, which I didn't think about. Uh, and by the way, go to mycolt.com slash live if you're watching this uh, in Instagram. You can see the graphics and you can post questions. Otherwise, I can't see it. Here's what it says. Use flexible raceways, conduit, and connectors. Mike, when do you use flexible transformers? Vibration. Well, the transformer is not vibrating in a sense that we need to have flex for that purposes. But look what this says. It says use flexible raceway conduits and connectors when possible as attachment to transformer enclosure. This is not a requirement of the manufacturer saying it. And you know why? This helps to reduce audible noise generation. Never thought about that. So transformers can be noisy, can be annoying. So if you put flex, the transformer can vibrate, but it's not going to have the metal raceway mechanically connected to the enclosure while the internal of the enclosure has a transformer, which is kind of having a little 60 hertz hum, and then that vibration travels over to the raceway, which the mechanical raceway, not a flexible raceway, over to the enclosure. So I guess that's not a bad idea. You don't have to, but you could. Next one. Let's read the next note. Adhere to NFPA 70, which is the National Electric Code, and minimum wire bending space requirements for the transformer enclosure. Well, they're saying, see, um, 312.6 talks about the minimum bending of terminations, but that's not our job. You buy the transformer and you terminate on the terminals and the transformer is designed automatically to have the terminals placed at a location so that there's enough space from the, where the conductors can come in that they can kind of bend to go into the terminal. As an industry standard, I'm not quite sure I like that term. What the heck does that mean? because I'm not aware of this, bundle associated phase neutral and equipment grounding conductors together within the transformer enclosure. Yeah, that's not possible. Let's go back over here. Here's a three phase. Primary is only two sets of parallel conductors, smaller wires that are secondary. And here's my three phases and my neutral equipment grounding conductor. And then three-phase neutral equipment grounding conductor, three-phase, well, they're automatically bundled because they're in the raceway. There's nothing we can do. Once we get out of the raceway, we, we got to mechanically make what we have to mechanically make. Same thing on the primary side. We're, we're paralleling that. We can't do any more than that. So this comment about industry standard bundling phase and neutral conductors, if we're talking about within the transformer, forget about that because you're going to do what you have to do. So I'm going to ignore that. Next one says, always use a calibrated torquing wrench to tighten electrical connections and terminals. For additional guidance, refer to UL 468. Let's see if we have any notes here. Okay, I was looking for a transfer that might have some uh, witness marks where they kind of put a slash mark. Let's see if I have a picture. Here you go. This is supposed to indicate that somebody used a torquing tool, calibrated, well, you don't have to be calibrated. They used an approved torquing mechanism 110.14D in the National Code tells us that we are required to torque it in an approved manner, which means a torquing wrench. And there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can make sure something is torqued properly. In this case here, let's say the bigger wires are your secondary, A, B, neutral, second equipment grounding conductor, three-phase equipment grounding conductor that terminate here. They torque the, where the lug is connected. They torque all this. And that is a 110.14D. That's required. And all this manufacturer instruction was saying, was like, hey, make sure you, you torque it, which is required. Next one. Ensure that raceways, conduits, and connectors enter the enclosure only in an area shown on the drawings. And what they mean by that is when you go to the manufacturer's information, the drawings you're referring to are the drawings that's contained within the instruction booklet. They want you to make sure that you bring conductors and cables, raceways and, and cables, in certain locations in the transformer, just like a panel. If you have a panel, and let's say it's going to be outside, you'll notice where the knockouts out are on the bottom of the enclosure, and there are knockouts on the side. But if you take a look at the knockouts on the side, those knockouts are only so high, you don't have knockouts going all the way up that panel because 
you don't want to have a ring tight enclosure and having knockouts. So you really can't like punch a knockout above the knockouts that are in that location, which would be the lower part. Same thing with the transformer. You can't just go in there and punch out a, a, an opening and then put conductors in there because there's a factor of heat. So what they've done in transformers, they've actually identified where you can bring those conductors in that enclosure. So let's look at this graphic here. Just to review some things. Okay, oh, there's a purple yellow. Okay, brown, orange, yellow, brown, purple, yellow. So multiple colors, I like, to, I like to see that we have purple. There's an equipment grounding conductor and there's your 250.10A required equipment grounding terminal bar within the transformer. Um, here is my XO to the case, that's 250.30A, which has to do with the system bonding jumper. And the grounding electroconductor is coming out of the same point where there's a system bonding jumper, that's a 250.30. And then that goes to a grounding electrode. So we're connecting it to the structural steel. Now the steel itself is not a grounding electrode, but the steel can be used as a conductor to connect to the grounding electrode. So if this steel is actually connected to a grounding electrode, well then we can connect to the steel and use the steel as a conductor that would ultimately connect to the electrode. See, the electrodes are always under the ground. Everything above the ground would be a, a conductive path to be able to use. And this is not the time to get into the details, but that's just some information. So we're running a grounding electric conductor from the transformer to, the, to a grounding electrode in 250.30, I think it's A5, somewhere in there. Uh, and somebody can correct me, I got my earbuds on here in case I'm wrong there. It says that when you ground a transformer, you need to ground it to the same grounding electrode as the building grounding electrode. So if the structural steel is ultimately connected to the building grounding electrode, then I can just take any transformer, go to structural steel, use the structural steel as a conductor to go ultimately to the grounding electrode. Getting really ahead of ourselves here. And if you're getting like a little confused and you don't quite understand exactly what I'm saying, then you need to get my grounding and bonding book. And by the way, never just buy a book from me, which is great, buy a book. The most important thing is you get the book and you get the DVDs. I have experts that explain everything. And you know what? If you're an electrician out there, if you're an engineer, if you're an instructor, if you're an inspector, if you're an electrical contractor, I really think that you should be able to know how to put it in a transformer. But sometimes I get these questions. I'm like, man, these guys, I don't know. All right, let's go back to our graphic. Do I need flexible? No. You can run flexible if you want to because it might be just simply easier in order to get the wiring there. Plus, what's the advantage of having flexible? Well, we'd have less noise from the transformer, just this 60 hertz hum, transferring to the mechanical raceway. And then, of course, the mechanical raceway connects to a panel board. And so you're going to have a little bit more noise if, if you care about noise. If you don't care about noise, then run the wire method that you want to. You can use MC cable, but there's some problems with paralleling MC cable, and this is not the time to be talking about uh, 250.102C. All right, so we'll look at the transformer. Nothing special there. Um, let's go on some, some more information. And it, oh, okay, I was just asked to say hi to Monty Tech in Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, Pittsburgh, and uh, a lot of students watching, guys. I love it. All right, let's get now to the next information. Continuing on transformers. In addition to ensuring that ventilation is maintained, the termination of raceways and cables in the transformer enclosure must be in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. 1103B says you have to install equipment according to listed and labeled instructions. So if you have a manual, and you know what? Get your instructions for your transformers and read them. If you have a manual and it tells you, listen, you can only have the raceways enter at certain locations. Here's an example uh, of a diagram that's within instruction manual saying, hey, listen, this is the area for raceway entry, whether you use a raceway or a cable, that's the area. So now I took a graphic that I had and I superimposed that area because somebody had said to me on a previous video, Mike, I think those raceways on the top right-hand side which would be, what do we got here? Brown, brown. Oh, here we go. Brown, uh, brown, orange, yellow. Here's the primary. Three parallel sets on the primary. Oh, look at this. And there's four parallel sets on the secondary. Oh, and then we have a neutral here. And we have a neutral there. Okay, that's another way to do it. No big deal. 
And here's your secondary conductors. And they said, Mike, I think the raceways on the top right hand side are violating the instructions. But if we take a look at the instructions here, and if we superimpose it, it looks like those raceways, the two parallel sets, oh, look at that. They have two raceways paralleling four sets of conductors. So we'd have, looks like two blacks, two reds, two blues, two neutrals, so black, red, blue, neutral. So that's gonna be eight conductors. Hmm, we'd have to be watching and doing a calculation to see if that would be fine. So it looks like this raceway is fine. And, and by the way, you see the bonding bushings and bonding jumpers? Um, they look, oh here, you can see that they put bonding bushings and bonding jumpers on the primary side. And they're the same thing on the secondary side. This is probably like in local three or whoever else in the country like, oh, we gotta put, come on. Why would you put bonding bushings and bonding jumpers on, on feeders or branch circuits when it's not required by the code? It just doesn't make any sense. That's no different than any other raceway. Now you would put equipment grounding conductors within. So those are there inside the raceway because it's a flexible raceway. And 251.18 would not recognize those raceways as equipment grounding conductors. So yes, equipment grounding conductor in the raceway, no, bonding bushings and bonding jumpers. Oh, Mike, the code's a minimum. Well, if that's the case, then why don't you just do everything bigger for everything? On every raceway, put bonding bushings and bonding jumpers. Get rid of the bonding bushings and bonding jumpers. Well, you treat it like a service. No, you don't treat it like a service. You treat it just like feeder conductors, all right? So that's all I have on transformers. I'm sure you have other questions. If you do, go to mikeholt.com slash live, post the questions there, and then I'll eventually discuss those. So now, as I go along, you guys might have posted questions. I'll hear about those questions, and I'll come back and kind of like do a little summary before I finish up this video. That was a lot of time we spent just on that one rule, but we covered a lot of different things, and I hope that kind of puts it in perspective and how that works. But there's so many more rules that I didn't discuss. And by the way, go to your app store and download Mike Holt Electrical Toolbox. And all you got to do is electrical toolbox, and then you can just do a transformer, click transformers, primary voltage, secondary voltage, whatever the load or the KVA, whatever it is, press boom. And then you can get all the information you really, really, really need to do that. And you have to look at the results page. And this is really great for instructors to make sure all your students have this. And that way you can use that as a, as a teaching tool. Or if you do transformers and you can't remember exactly what it is, don't worry about it. Go to my toolbox, it's free. I do all I can for you guys. Okay, question came up is, is there a flex conduit link before you install equipment grounding conductor? If you're doing transformers and your circuit is going to be more than 20 amperes, then you are always going to be installing an equipment grounding conductor. So it isn't a matter of a length or not a length. And you get that on 250, 118, probably paren five, which talks about flex of metal conduit and when you can use it as an equipment grounding conductor. So now you can go to 250.118 and read about when the, the flex is suitable as an equipment grounding conductor, but for all practical purposes, it's not. If you're using flex for primary, secondary transformer, it's gonna be over 20 amperes, well then use an equipment grounding conductor. If it's not, and if the length is not more than six feet and your protection device is not more than 20 amperes, well then you're fine. Question comes in, well, what about the EMT? Did that require an equipment grounding conductor? Of course not. <laughs> 251.18, I don't know the print number on the equipment grounding conductor. That's probably, one is wire type. I, I, I don't know which was EMT. I, I want to say PRIN 3, but I never really thought about its number. The EMT is suitable as an equipment grounding conductor, regardless of the length. So as you see in our graphic here, we would not put an equipment grounding conductor because the raceway itself serves as an equipment grounding conductor. We don't put bonding bushings in bondage others. And I heard that it's a PRIN 4 for EMT, and I never ever used that rule in my lifetime. And you can see on the primary, equipment grounding conductor within a flexible raceway, but no bonding bushing and bonding jumper because there's no code rule to do something that, why would we do it? When we've already talked about, you already have it in the raceway and you're already using the raceway and both of those are equipment grounding conductors and 
And the lock nuts make that bonding connection like it would be at any raceway if there's no concentric knockouts or incentric knockouts remaining. All right, done with transformers. This was a question that we had previously covered and somebody, a friend of mine said, Mike, uh, I think you confused me there because I don't think you're right. When I reply back, oh, you're 100% right. I was 100% wrong. So let's just review when you're bundling MC cable. All right. So when you bundle conductors and you don't maintain spacing, so if you bundle them and don't maintain spacing for more than 24 inches, then you're going to have to go to table 31015C1, and there's an adjustment factor depending upon the number of conductors that you would bond. But 31015C1D says if you're bundling MC or AC cables, and let's read the rule here, and the cables have no outer jacket because you can get MC cable with an outer jacket. So probably in a building, you're not going to be bundling MC cable with an outer jacket. That usually be black and marked direct burial or poured in the concrete. So it's just traditional MC cable or armor cable. And each cable has conductors. Each cable has no more than three current carrying conductors. Well, that would be your three hots and a neutral because neutral is never considered a current carrying conductor. That's 310, 15, Oh boy, they changed the number on that. Probably, I'm gonna, I don't know what the number is. 31015 talks about the neutral, I'm gonna say it's F, talks about the neutral conductor, the neutral conductor of a, of a three phase four wire circuit that's not supplying linear loads is not considered a current conductor. And if it is supplying more than 50%, then it would be considered a current carrying conductor. Okay, and then it goes on the conductors are 12 gauge copper. So aluminum would not work. And you have no more than 20 current carrying conductors bundled. Well, you got to count the number of current carrying conductors within a cable. And then you got to count the total number of conductors of those conductors that are current carrying in a bundle. If you don't exceed 20 conductors, well, then you don't have to apply table 31015C1 adjustment factor. You're fine. Just don't even worry about it. But if you go more than 20 current carrying conductors that are bundled for more than 20, that are not maintaining spacing for more than 24 inches, well, then you have to use the table. But then there's a note. There's, it says this, and I believe that's an exception. So I don't see it there shown as an exception. If more than 20 current carrying conductors don't maintain 24 inch separation, meaning I call them bundling, then you have to apply a 60% adjustment factor. Let's just say that, you know what, I'm not going to get involved and count how many conductors are current carrying within the raceway and all. I'm just going to say, you know what, I'm bundling a bunch of MC cable. The worst case scenario, no matter how many times you bundle it, you're going to apply a 60% adjustment factor. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to be aware of when you're applying an adjustment factor for ampacity. Um, and number one is that you have to apply the adjustment factor to the opacity of the conductor based upon the insulation rating. So what's the insulation rating of MC conductors? What well, the insulation rating of conductors of any insulation, whether it's Romex, MC cable, armor cable, whether you're pulling wire in there, it's going to be 90 degrees C conductor. So that when you're going to adjust the opacity, or you're going to correct the impasse, adjust has to do with bundling, and correcting has to do with um, temperature factors, elevated ambient temperatures. When you're going to make the impasse adjustment or correction, you use the 90 degrees C rating of the conductors based upon table 31016. So looking at our example, if we have more than 20 current carrying conductors in MC, or AC or MC cables that are bundled, the impasse of 12 gauge wire after it's been adjusted because we use a 60% adjustment factor based upon the 90 degrees C opacity of 12 gauge. So if you go to the code book and you look at 31016, what's the opacity of 12 gauge? The opacity of 12 gauge is not 20 amps. 90 degrees C conductor, it's 30 amps. So then you make the adjustment to the opacity and make sure you read what is the definition of opacity in article 100. All right. So if you're taking 60% of 30 amperes, well, then that comes out to be 18 amperes. Okay, so now we know that the 12 gauge wire is rated 30 amperes. After adjustment, it's rated 18 amperes. 
we have to make sure conductors are protected at their opacity. So then we go to 240.4b, and it says, look, if the opacity of the wire, 18 amps, does not correspond to the standard side breaker, 20 amps, then you can use the next size up breaker or fuse, 20 amps, on the, on the wire, which is 18 amps, as long as you're not supplying receptacle outlets. Well, if you're not supplying receptacles or receptacle outlets, well, then what are you supplying? Lighting. Okay, so if you're only supplying lighting loads, because, see, if you're only supplying lighting loads and no receptacles, then you can figure out what the load's going to be on that lighting circuit. If you're using the circuit to supply receptacles, well, then you have, a, they have an 18 amp wire and the next size up 240.4b doesn't apply because they can't predict what kind of load's gonna be on that circuit. So 18 amp wire is okay to be on a 20 amp breaker as long as you're not supplying receptacles. Look at 240.4b, we got that. Now, and now this wire is permitted on a 20 amp lighting circuit, like I just referenced, 244B, and it's permitted to be continuous load up to 16 amperes. Because see, the maximum loading that you can put on a 20 amp breaker, which is gonna be 21019A1B, and also 210.20A, the max load you can put on a 20 amp breaker is going to be 16 amps. So you can have 16 amps continuous on an 18 amp wire on a 20 amp breaker. So now make sure you look at 210.19A1B. I had made a mistake saying that you were limited to 80% of that conductor ampacity, and I said it was 14.4 amps, and I was wrong. You don't limit the amount of current on a conductor after you apply the ampacity adjustment. So guess what? Bundle all the MC cable you want to supplying lighting circuits. It doesn't really matter how many cables, how many conductors, how many current carrying. Just apply the 60% adjustment factor and you're good to go. So then forget about impacity adjustment factors on MC and AC cables. It's just never going to be a factor if you're supplying lighting. Supplying receptacle loads, well, then it's a problem. Okay, moving on to the next topic. Grounding of service equipment. Um, I don't have a reference here right now, but I, if any, see, you need to go to mycolt.com. You need to go to videos. You need to go to grounding and bonding, and you need to watch the very first video. It's all free. That's called grounding fundamentals. You have to watch that video. It's about an hour, I think, in 13 minutes. Um, so I'm going to say things. You're not going to understand what I'm even saying until you actually watch that video, and, and you really need to understand electrical theory because everything I'm talking about is, is physics. You need to get my theory book and you get my theory DVDs. And by the way, um, I talked to my office today. They said that any product I have, whether it's motor controls, whether it's power quality, exam preparation, anything, if you're watching this video, you can go to mycolt.com, go to products, buy any product you want to, that's a library, and you can get 30% off. And when you go out of the shopping cart, the discount code, just simply put LIVE, L-I-V-E, you'll automatically get a 30% discount. All right, back to the rules, grounding of service equipment. Now, here's the question. Mike, I installed two 200 amp meter mains on the side of a duplex with two individual risers. So meter main, meter main, two risers, the utility comes in with one drop, connects to both risers. The inspector said he wanted no more than one set of two grounds. Well, the code requires us that all service equipment has to be grounded to the same grounding electrode. So the inspector saying you can't like put a couple ground rods over there and ground that service and then put a couple grounds over here and ground that service, that you're going to have to ground to the same same electrode. So if you don't put ground rods, then you come out of the service equipment. Let's say you're going to do um, a U for ground or the rebar. Well, if you go to the rebar and from the one service and go to rebar for the other service, well, then you're using the same electrode, then you're good. If you're not going to use a concrete encased electrode and you're going to put ground rods, well, you're not going to put four ground rods. You're going to put two ground rods and you're going to use those two ground rods as your grounding electrode system. Here's what he says. 
The inspector said he wanted no more than one set of two ground rods. Well, you could always put more than two ground rods if you want to. Of course, it makes no sense. So you, you don't have to put more than two. You're, you're going to probably put in two, and we'll talk about that. And he wanted them to connect as a loop with one side ending in surface A. So you have a meter main over here, and then you go to the first ground rod, and the first ground rod is bonded at second ground rod. And the other side, which is the other surface disconnecting means, meter main, he wants to connect it to the other ground rod, which is bonded to the other ground rod. And I'm thinking, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I mean, I don't know how else you'd do it mechanically, uh, you know, that would make any sense. So if you had two ground rods and you got two service disconnecting means, well, you come down to the first one and you connect to it and you come down to the second one, you connect to it, and then you put a jumper between the two electrodes because you can bond the electrodes together. It makes sense. I mean, if you're going to a grounding electrode. So now, Let's just review the rules on grounding. 250-24A1 says that we are required to ground the equipment of a service. And that's actually 250.4A2 that talks about the philosophy of, of why we do what we do. So 254A2 says that we have to ground equipment. But when you get the services, 250.24A1 says, here's what you do. Connect to the neutral not to the case of the enclosure. Connect to the neutral and go to the electrode. You can make the connection out of the meter can, or you can make the connection out of the first disconnecting means. Well, sometimes people say, well, the utility doesn't want you to come out of the meter can. Okay, fine. They don't want you to come out of the meter can, whatever. Then come out of the disconnecting means. Some people say, no, we don't want you coming out of the disconnecting means. We want you to come out of the meter can. Because sometimes in the past, not so much anymore in the future, in the 2020 code, sometimes they had the disconnecting means located in the building and just a meter outside. Well, if you had the meter outside only and the disconnect is inside, maybe you might find out that they would prefer you to come on the outside and while well, we want to keep it outside the building. The code doesn't care if you come out of the meter can or if you come out of the first disconnecting means to the grounding electrode. Looking, if it was an overhead service, come out of the meter can, come out of the first disconnecting means. And if you want to, uh, not very common today, but years ago, simply come off of the service drop neutral. And out of the service drop neutral, come right down to the grounding electrode. Imagine, because I don't have any graphics, that this was one duplex and this was another duplex. And we have to use the same common grounding electrode because it's on the same building. Well, if you put two ground rods in between, you just bring a wire down to one, bring a wire down to the other, and uh, that's good. I mean, I don't know how else you do it because you need to ground each disconnect on a duplex like that. And you have two ground rods. If that's what you're using, well, that would make sense to me to follow the inspector's suggestion. Now, the code, let's talk about what are considered grounding electrodes. We were talking about ground rods, but you don't have to use ground rods if you don't want to. What are the different types of electrodes you could use? Well, 250.50 tells us underground metal water pipe. There are places in the United States that actually have metal underground water pipe supplied to the building. Well, if you have 10 feet of metal underground water pipe supplied to the building, you can use that as an electrode. But because they might replace that metal water pipe someday, the code requires us that we have to have a supplemental electrode to the water pipe grounding electrode. And if it's a brand new building, probably a concrete encased electrode is what we're going to use to supplement the water pipe. If it's an existing building, the most practical thing you're going to use is going to be a couple ground rods to supplement it. You're going to have to always supplement the metal water piping electrode. Um, you can use a concrete encased electrode. That is probably the number one ground rod you're going to use in a brand new install because you're having rebar there. And if the rebar meets the requirements of the concrete encased electrode, and we'll talk a little bit about that, well then you're done. Just go to rebar with four gauge wire. A ground ring. I. I actually see absolutely no reason why anybody wouldn't run a ground ring around a building as an electrode, but some people think it's a great idea to run a ground ring. And I, I challenge anybody to give me the physics and why you'd put a ground ring around an entire building. You have to encircle the entire building and connect them together. Then make a big circle one is like, put a couple of ground rods and, you know, go to the concrete encased electrode. Two ground rods with a six gauge wire, or that's 250.66A, or go to the concrete 
In case electrode, the rate bar with a four gauge wire, you're done. Why would you run a ground ring? It, there are no physics. I'll cover about that in my theory book. No physics about ground rings at all. It's just somebody does it. Okay, it's fine. So if you put a ground ring there, and if you put a concrete encased electrode, if there's a water pipe in there, if there's rebar in there, and if you take a look at the graphic, if there's any other listed electrodes, so they do make special electrodes, well, then you have to bond them all together. Well, then guess what? Don't put anything there, but the concrete's there. Use the rebar as your primary electrode. If there's water, use that as a, another electrode that's supplemented by the other electrode. All right, so what's a concrete in case electrode? Well, 250-52A3 says, well, 20 feet a half inch rebar. So go to the, in the, in the foundation or footer. So, so we gotta make sure that uh, located in the footer or foundation. So if it's in the footer foundation and it's 20 feet long and it's rebar, half inch, well, it doesn't have to be one bar. It can be any number of combinations that add up to 20 feet. Well, that's fine. You could have 20 feet of copper wire in a concrete encased electrode. Probably not a very good idea. Who's going to leave four gauge wire in a rebar and a foot or a foundation and tie it, let's say, in there and think that it's going to be there the next day? But code does say that is another option. Okay, so that would be probably the electrode that you're going to use because it's going to be available before you pour the concrete. Now, that concrete case electrode is only if your concrete is in direct contact with the earth. So let's read the rules. Rebar and concrete separated by insulation, vapor barriers, films, or similar items isn't considered in direct, direct contact with the earth. So it can't serve as a grounding electrode. So if you're at a building and they put a vapor barrier or insulation or anything that's gonna be um, non-conductive, so that the concrete is not in direct contact with the earth, well then that's not an electrode. Okay, well if it's not an electrode, what do I do? Don't worry about it, put a couple of ground rods and then you're done. See, you only have to use a concrete in case electrode if it's there. You don't have to make a concrete in case electrode. So if there's a vapor barrier, insulation, it's not there, don't worry about it, put a couple of ground rods, it's the most practical way that you would have your grounding electrode for the purposes of grounding um, the building grounding electrode system. You are not required in an existing building to chip out the concrete to get to the rebar. Now, that's if it's existing. Well, Mike, what about if we got a brand new building being built? We didn't get there in time before they poured the concrete. We didn't make a connection to the rebar. Can I just drive a couple ground rods? I'm thinking it was there before they poured a concrete. It's a brand new building. The fact that you didn't go there, um, I think I'd make you chip it up. It's not that big of a deal. It's an emotional thing. Like, oh man, you gotta be kidding. Oh, yeah. How long is it gonna chip it all up? Don't fight it, you screwed up. Go in there and chip it all up. Put your connection there, clean it all up, and get it grounded to the rebar. And then guess what? Next time you're going to know the rule and you're going to be a little bit better prepared. But don't be complaining to the inspector because you didn't know the code. Listen, you're the leaders. You're the expert. You're an apprentice that's going to be a leader. You're a journeyman. I mean, yeah, you're a wireman. You know, you're going to be a leader. You need to be a licensed electrician. And then once you become a licensed electrician, as your career goes, you need to be a master electrician. Don't just be out there running pipe and pulling wire and don't even know what you're doing. Don't just top out at the local or, or school apprenticeship like that and just stop. We need you to replace my Colt. I'm a leader here. I'm going to be gone one day. I need you guys to move up and I need you to increase yourself and your skills because you're supposed to protect the public. So become a master electrician. If you decide you want to go into business, well, then make sure you get our business programs and, a, and our curriculum and our estimating books. And then, then that's great. Put yourself in, in, in an administrative position. And someday you might decide you want to run your business or you want to be an engineer, go to engineering school, or, or maybe you want to be an electrical inspector, or you want to be an electrical contractor, electrical instructor. Just keep growing. Don't, don't just stop. We need you to continue to grow to become the leader so that you guys can do a better job than me and my generation. So learn your code. Make sure you get my books, my videos, and study. Hope these videos that's for free, that, that's good for you. All right, now, now let's continue on. So now, 
ground rods. What's the deal about a ground rod that's going to be, well, number one says a single ground rod must be supplemented by an additional electrode. If you're driving a ground rod and you have to supplement the one ground rod with another electrode, probably what electrode would you supplement it with? Another ground rod, because obviously the rebar is not there or you wouldn't have driven a ground rod. If you have a concrete encased electrode, you don't add another electrode by driving ground rods. So then you have a ground rod, what are you going to have to do? Add another ground rod, and here's what it says. And it must be bonded to another ground rod or these other different choices that you could have. Okay, so the supplemental electrode, the other electrode you're going to add must be bonded to another ground rod. So you can take that electrode bonded here. By the way, we're not splicing the grounding electric conductor. The grounding electric conductor has to be unbroken to the electrode. These two electrodes, simply this is being a bonding connection. So you bond all electrodes together and you run a grounding electric conductor unbroken to any convenient electrode. So this is an unspliced grounding electric conductor. Here is your bonding of electrodes, so that's good. Now, you could use a single electrode, though, because that's an exception. See, if you, put a, if you put a ground rod, you have to supplement it with another ground rod, which would be another ground rod, two ground rods. But the exception says that if you measure the resistance of the ground, or the contact resistance of the ground rod to the earth, and if it's 25 ohms or less, you're good to go, one ground rod. Probably you don't have a ground resistance meter, so you're probably not going to measure that. So you know you don't know what the resistance is going to be. You're going to add another electrode, and when you add another electrode, 25053A3 says it can't be any closer than six feet. So if you're not going to measure the resistance of one grounding electrode, or if you do, and if it's not less than 25 feet, you're adding a second electrode to create a grounding electrode system. You put a bonding conductor between those two electrodes and you make sure those electrodes are not any closer than six feet. Now you just created your grounding electrode system and you terminate the grounding electric conductor unbroken from the service neutral to any electrode. So if you had two service disconnecting means and you have one grounding electrode system of two ground rods bonded together, well then you run a grounding electric conductor to one ground rod you run another grounding electric conductor to the other ground rod, and you have the two ground rods together bonded. Now, that would require you four fittings. But what you could do, and smartly figure this all out, run the wire from the one service through the grounding electrode to the, to the first grounding electrode through your, through your direct burial fitting, put it on there, then run it through the other acorn, right? Grounding electrode fitting, and then go unbroken all the way up. It doesn't have to be unbroken between the two. But I mean, why put four fittings when you can just use two fittings? But four fittings are fine too. All right. So hopefully that kind of, it's a lot of different rules. It maybe gets you going. Yes, I heard a question. The question is, is a duplex considered two separate buildings? I don't know. And I'm pretty sure under the building code, they are not considered two separate buildings. So when you have more than one building, well, any, okay, all the rules apply to a single building. And if you go to Article 100, the definition of a building describes what a building is. Okay, so a duplex is not two different buildings. You'd have to go to the building code, read the definition 100, go to the building code, and what defines a building. A building, if you have something structurally next to each other, is where it has a fire rating between the buildings completely, which means it goes all the way up through the roof. You might have seen some buildings where you see there's a roof, and then there's like a little concrete wall that goes above it, and then there's a, there's a part of the roof in between and concrete, like townhouses. Sometimes they could be separate buildings, and some hot times are not. Well, so no, a duplex is not two buildings. And, and if it was two buildings, well then the service would have to be on each of the individual buildings. And of course, you're not gonna put the service for a duplex at two different locations. You're gonna put them at one location because it is one building. So hopefully that helps you there. If you think otherwise, go to your building code, find out what it is, and then send me an email, mike at mikeholt.com. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find out. Oh, Mike's right again. Okay.
question came in was like, hey, Mike, does the inspector have jurisdiction to say where the grounding electrode conductor comes out at the service? Okay, the code says meter can or the disconnect, period. Now, some inspectors are like, I don't want you coming out of the meter can. I want you coming out of the service disconnect. You're like, dude, it doesn't matter at the meter can or the disconnect. Other inspectors will say, I don't want you coming out of the service disconnect. I want you coming out of the meter. You're like, dude, the code says from the meter and from the service drop all the way to the service disconnect means it doesn't matter. We're just grounding the equipment. Now, what do you do with the authority have his jerks? The authority have a jurisdiction says, I want you to come out of one location or the other. You know what? It's not worth the die on that hill. Like, okay, fine. And understand that it's just something he or she emotionally feels. Um, and you can, but look at the, what 250.24A1 says, sir, miss. It says at, from any location from this point to that point. Well, if the person doesn't really care about facts, and there are people out there don't care about facts, well, then what are you going to do? You know, so me, I, I die on every hill, but I don't suggest my son, who's an electrical contractor, do what I would do. I just, I can't have somebody telling me something that's not true. I just can't. I just got to fight it. But it's not a good business model. All right. We're going to go to the next question. And I think, uh, wow, am I going to have time to do this? I'm going to give it a shot to finish this up real quick here. Here's a question. Sizing of the grounding electrode conductor. Mike, I have two sets of 250 KC mill aluminum conductors for a 400 amp service. Well, 250 KC mill aluminum, if you go to table 31016, I can't remember exactly what it is. I want to say it's 205 amperes. Somebody can double check that. So yeah, that's parallel two, 250s. Yep, 400 amp service. According to table 25066, the ground in the electric conductor must be sized at least one aught copper or three aught aluminum. Let's go to the table. Two 250s gives me 500 KC mils. Okay, oh, it was aluminum. Oh, oh, whoa, I'm wrong here. Since it's, oh, I got to fix that. Let me go. So it'd be two. Oh, I'm going to go back over here. And so must be at least two, two AWG copper or, oh man, press the wrong button, or one odd aluminum. And I do this because it maybe help you kind of remember that. So go back to the table. So if I'm parallel two 250s aluminum here with 250 times two is 500 KC mils, through would be a two gauge copper or one odd aluminum. Okay, let's go back to the question. The inspector says I only need a six gauge wire to the ground rod. If that's true, what's the purpose of table 25066? Well, let's read the rule. The code rule says on 25066, which is how you size a grounding electric conductor, looking in myquote.com slash live, you can see all my graphics. The size of the grounding electric conductor at the service or at each building or structure, whether supplied by a feeder or branch circuit or its separately derived systems of a grounded or ungrounded AC system shall not be less than given in the table. Well, Mike, it can't be less than what's given in the table and two 250 KC mils aluminum conductor is 500 KC mils. It can't be less than two copper or two watt aluminum. But here's the little thing, except as permitted in 25066A through C. So when do you use the table? You don't use a table when you're using 25066 A, B, or C. Well, what's A rule? Well, here, connection to a rod pipe or a plate electrode. If the grounding electric conductor or bonding jumpers connected to a single or multiple rod pipe or plate electrodes or any combination of them, and it does not to extend to any other electrode that requires a large size conductor, the grounding electric conductor should not be required to be larger than six gauge copper or four gauge aluminum. So what size grounding electric conductor would you run anytime you have ground rods? Six gauge. So in this example here, it was a 400 amp feeder supplied by two sets of 250 KC mills. We would only use a six gauge wire. So when you use a table, well, when it's not A, B or C, A is what? 
a ground rot is going to be um, six gauge. B, let me go to B. So A is a ground rod, no larger than six gauge. 25066B is no larger than four gauge when you go into a concrete encased electrode. 256C has to do with the ring, which who would the heck want a ring around a building, which makes no sense as a building grounding electrode. But if you did, then it doesn't have to be any larger than the size of the ring. So then when do you use a table? Well, when you're not going to a, a ground rod and when you're not going to a concrete encased electrode and when you're not going to a ring. So every other case is when you use the table. So back to the question, he's running two sets of 250KC mills. A table says two gauge copper or one odd aluminum, but the running ground rods and the inspector says just use six gauge wire. And the inspector is 100% correct. And that's it. Now, the next graphic, all right, all right, we're done with this. We're gonna take some follow-up questions and I'm gonna be covering aluminum wire termination tomorrow. I was hoping I could get it today, but we're not gonna get it. So what's the follow-up question? Okay, the question comes in, hey, Mike, twice, or you said that according to the code that the ground rods have to be a minimum of six feet apart from each other. That's 250.53A3. He says, I've taken some seminars from other organizations and they said that the ground rod separation should be no less than the length of the ground rod. So if you put 10 foot ground rod, they should be 10 feet. Or it should not be any length than twice, any, should be not any closer than twice the length of a ground rod. So two times eight foot would be 16 feet, two times 10 feet would be 20 feet. And they're, so you know what? I don't really care what other people think. I don't care what other things or any suggestions are made. You go to the code book and we are inspecting jobs, installing jobs in accordance with the code, not what somebody else is teaching. So if somebody says that the ground rods have to be spaced more than six feet, they're just wrong because it's not required by the code. Is there any value in spacing them more than six feet? Nope, because if there was, the code would say, you have to space them more than six feet. All right, so that's the end of that. And if you watched any of this on Instagram, of course, you can't see graphics illustrations because we can't display it on Instagram. Uh, go back and watch this on mycolt.com slash live. And uh, by the way, go to mycolt.com, go to products, any product, for those of you watching this videotape, and you can tell somebody else if you want about that, you can get any library, which is a book in videos, the combination at 30% off. My best recommendation is get the ultimate training library at 30% off. If not, exam prep, there's a business management library, there's a bonding and grounding library, there's an understanding code library, there's a theory library. So go to mycolt.com, look at products, and get your, and how do you say it? Put in the discount code LIVE, L-I-V-E. God bless, and I will see you at the next video. Thank you so much.